we have studied Matthew and Mark, and now we want to look to Luke. I think I mentioned this in going over Matthew and Mark, but um, what I want to do now is notice that we're calling the gospel of Christ the perfect man. That's what we'll call Luke, the gospel of Christ, the perfect man. I give you again, as we're accustomed is, key verses. Chapter 19, verse 10 of Luke, Luke 19, 10. For the Son of Man came to seek and to save that which was lost. And one more, chapter 24 and verse 19, not a part of the verse, things concerning Jesus the Nazarene, who was a prophet, mighty in deed and word before God and all the people. So those are, we'll call those our key verses. You may in reading the book come up with others you think are more so than those, but that's what I'm using. Key words, son of man is used 26 times, such as in chapter 24, verse seven son of man and then to preach or teach glad tidings it's used some 10 times i won't try to cite verses of course gospel means glad tidings we say good news am i still on Yeah, we'll see. Yes, you're still on. Okay. Couldn't had a glitch fly up there. Okay. So I like uh, glad tidings. Uh, those are two words not used nowadays regularly. We use the word good news. I think uh, while the power of God and salvation would be good news of which there is no gooder, <laughs> which there is no greater. So certainly. That's what we could say about the whole gospel system. And we'll say for the key phrase in the book, we'll say that's glorifying God. And uh, I won't just stop at that one. There's similar expressions in the book. Uh, and these are used more in Luke's gospel account than in all the rest of the New Testament. I thought that highly significant. And um, so there's our key verses and key words, key thought, and key phrase. Well, now let's look at a little bit of the background introduction. And the book does not identify its author. But again, from the earliest times, Christians have attrib attributed it to the physician Luke, Paul's associate. Luke was an Antiochian, if you want to call him that, a physician by profession. I might pause here and point out when we visited Corinth, they had excavated down to the time of the first century and they excavated a medical school. And what they found was that the way that they taught their students regarding the various diseases and various broken arms and legs and anything else that you'd have to deal with dealing with humans, they had just, uh, and you know how well the Greeks could carve the human body, sculpt it. They would have a sculpt, sculpted piece It'd be a broken arm or some wound or some growth. They would have it sculpted there. So they certainly weren't going to be able to uh, uh, have cadavers that they could work on. Um, we don't realize how much really was lost in knowledge when the Roman Empire uh, fell. It took them several hundred years to completely fall. But 
there was a tremendous amount of knowledge that they had that was really lost for what the Roman Catholic Church calls the uh, glorious age of the church, secular history called the Dark Ages. And uh, nevertheless, I thought that interesting, and I spent some time looking at all those things and dug up. Some of them even still had paint on them to try to color the various uh, wounds or growth or maladies or whatever that accompanied that kind of uh, wound or whatever it might be. And of course, we know that he was the long time companion of Paul, which would have made him be in a position to where he could have a lot of association with other uh, people, even other apostles, certainly other apostles. And thus, since he wrote the book of Acts, he has left us two books that really come down to the matter of being the best medicine of all, medicine of the soul, for even Jesus said that he was the great physician. Uh, Eusebius had a quote along that line, and he lived between 260 and 340 AD, which puts him still quite a ways from the time of Christ, first century, but not uh, as far as we are, which I think, again, if we can count on Eusebius, though he was not inspired of the Holy Spirit, as we would any historical comment from someone who wrote about something in those days, then uh, certainly we realize that any history uh, must be looked at in the same way. That's the reason it's very interesting to study Luke in particular, especially when you get in the book of Acts, because he cites so many particular things that can be verified when it comes to a study of history. Well, he was a Grecian, and uh, in Greek, Luke would have been Lucanus, and so Luke is shortened from that. And we don't have anything definite about his place of birth. A fourth century writer by the name of Jerome said he was from Antioch in Syria. Well, whether he was or he wasn't, here's one man who wrote extensively in those days, fourth century, who said he was. Of course, he was a Gentile, a non-Jew. And when you read Paul's letter to the Colossians in chapter 4, um, well, verses 10 through 14, Paul lists his Jewish workers then those who were Gentiles. And of course, Luke is mentioned among the latter. So this makes um, Luke the only Gentile writer of the New Testament. Being the educated person that he was, he would have been a man of refinement, a man of culture of his day. He would have been somebody the Apostle Paul could sit down with as a peer in his learning. He had a very, when you study the Greek, and I mentioned a few things about his words, he had a very rich vocabulary. And when you read, you find that he had um, a greater variety of words than any other New Testament writer. There are some 800 words that he uses that the others never use. And for those who are scholars in the Koine Greek, he was a master of good Greek style. An accomplished writer, a close observer, an unassuming historian, a well-instructed physician, and a most faithful friend, so says Frederick Farrar. We don't know a thing about his conversion, but the historical record reveals him in Acts 16, 8 through 10, where he uses the first person plural 
pronoun we. And from this, we can conclude that he joined Paul's evangelistic band in Troas between 51 and 54 AD. Well, looking more at him being a physician, Colossians chapter 4, verse 14. Um, obviously, this goes without saying that his profession was highly advanced. We could compare his knowledge of medicine, that's what I meant about a lot of things being lost when Rome fell for a long time, but we could compare his knowledge of medicine to 19th century uh, medical doctors. He followed in the steps of Hippocrates, and you remember the Hippocratic Oath, not the Hippocratic Oath, but the Hippocratic Oath, and they had lived as the father of medicine, supposedly, on the Greek. He lived from 460 to 377 BC. So you see that uh, professional study of medicine had been around for a long time before Luke came on the scene. But in those days, a physician didn't necessarily occupy a high social position. What you'll find that differed to a great extent from the slavery that we focus on America because they didn't care uh, what particular race was a slave, but Greek slaves were highly prized for the simple reason that many of them were highly educated. Um, and many of the physicians were slaves and then nothing to indicate that he had ever been a slave. But one thing about those who owned slaves in those days is that many times their masters let them um, earn extra income and if they did a good job a lot of times it had to do with them just liking that slave a lot never had any trouble out of that slave there were many slaves who actually purchased their own freedom and uh, slavery there were more slaves in the Roman Empire than there were free people. And as I say, slavery had nothing to do with a particular race at that time. It was anybody. And um, you could be sold into slavery because you couldn't pay your bills. And uh, husband, wife, all children could be sold into slavery. Early on in the Roman Republic, and even on up until this time, and for some time thereafter, when the Romans conquered people, they sold lots of folks into slavery. Do you remember the book Ben Hur or the movie where Charlton Heston played Ben Hur? Anybody remember that? Well, if you do, then uh, remember that he was sold into slavery and then was able to get out of slavery. But doubtless then he ministered as a physician and a companion to the needs of Paul and others that were traveling with him, which brings us up to about the power to work miracles. Miracles were, were not just work for the sake of working a miracle. Miracles were worked for the primary purpose. They were given in the baptismal measure of the Holy Spirit to the apostles and in the laying on of hands by the apostles and other members of the church. And that was to prove that the gospel was from God, not from man. Now, if you look closer in Luke's record, he gives a particular attention to the miracles of healing, giving details as to the nature of the affliction, and he uses proper medical terminology to describe them. Chapter 5 and verse 12, he doesn't just say a man has leprosy, he says the man was full of leprosy. He's an advanced case. 
chapter 438, you'll remember Peter's mother-in-law had a fever, but Luke says she was holding with a great fever. Chapter 4 and verse 23, only Luke here mentions the proverb, physician, heal thyself. In chapter 12 and verse 11, the woman had been ill 18 years, and he said and was bowed together and could in no wise lift herself up or bowed together. She would have been bowed and bowed. In 843, Luke, um, I guess that's what say it, moderates the report of the woman who had suffered at the hands of quacks or worthless physicians. And you might compare that to the book we just finished where Mark talks about the same thing in chapter 5 and uh, verse 25. William Hobart wrote a noteworthy book entitled The Medical Language of Luke. So if you run across that, William Hobart, H-O-B-A-R-T, you might want to try to get that and add it to your library. Well, we find that he was a preaching doctor. He was an evangelist. In fact, all we really know of him is his involvement in the spreading of the gospel of Christ. Think of the books that he wrote, Luke and the book of Acts. These were designed to convince people that Jesus of Nazareth was the Son of God and to convert sinners and heirs of their way. Uh, his Acts of Apostles, and I like to say some of the Acts of some of the Apostles, has been instrumental in converting more than we can count because it tells about the church spreading the gospel and gives account of people obeying the gospel and thus we see their conversion. We've already said that he was a co-worker of Paul, uh, Philemon 24. Uh, he was with him as he underwent all manner of trial and privation. Irenaeus described Luke as inseparable from Paul, his words inseparable from Paul. And we can infer that he was uh, left to work with the infant church in the city of Philippi, Acts 16, 15 through 16 in chapter 17, verse 1. But he was also, as I've already alluded to this, a historian. In his prologue, chapter 1, verses 1 through 4, we get just a bit of a glimpse of how an inspired writer went about his work. Now let's remember he's not an apostle, even as Mark was not an apostle. And he tells us how he sought the historical facts in the matter. He consulted, he says, eyewitnesses and ministers of the word who had been in the church from the beginning. This tells us something about plenary verbal inspiration of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit would guide him in his own vocabulary to select and write infallibly what he wrote. It's an amazing thing about inspiration that you could write as the Holy Spirit gave you utterance or bore you along and not end up letting anything be influenced in the way of what is truth that you wrote about. And yet you would still use the vocabulary and the way of thinking, your mode of operation that was normal to you. God just guaranteed it to be infallible. That's an amazing thing to me. He was uh, familiar with other written records of the life of Christ. Who knows how many people may have written about Christ, but it was not inspired. Uh, it would be hard to believe 
that people who had the ability to ride and were truly converted to Christ is we read it the same in the New Testament. And since that's the only way to permanently preserve something, that they wouldn't be riding their friends and neighbors or whatever, doesn't mean they had to write a whole uh, gospel account. But God didn't intend that all of those be inspired. But he intended these to be inspired. And if you read what he says in the beginning, his, he was striving for accuracy in his report. And I would challenge anybody to just look at the book of Acts. No, I would say better closely examine it. See if you can find anything wrong with your geography in it. Um, he sought out and he recorded, as he says in Acts 1, verse 3, many proofs. So Luke placed Christ within a context of world history by citing six contemporary rulers and their dates. Chapter 1, verse 5. Chapter 2, verses 1 and 2. Chapter 3, verses 1 and 2. And what's interesting is that 110 persons are named by Luke in the book of Acts. 110. Now, one of the things about somebody that is being accurate is when they get out of generalities and get down to particulars or specifics. A fellow that is lying doesn't like to get into specifics because it's too hard to remember what he specified an hour ago and may need to refer back to and he can't remember it. That's the reason the fellow start lying, he ends up telling more lies. William Ramsey, I have his book. Uh, he did not believe the Bible was inspired of the Holy Spirit. But he said after he sought to disprove it, that every person is found just where he ought to be. He was uh, uh, an archaeologist historian with the British Museum in the 19th century and early part of the 20th century and uh, did a special study on this. How special was it? He spent some 34 years trying to disprove the historicity of the historical accuracy and trustworthiness of Luke. And you know what he concluded in his book? Luke is a historian, and I'm quoting him, Luke is a historian of the first rank. And he was changed completely by study of the book of Acts concerning Luke's ability by trying to disprove it. You may press, I quote here, you may press the words of Luke in a degree beyond any other historian, and they stand the keenest scrutiny and the harshest treatment. The bearing of recent discoveries is from, from the bearing of recent discoveries on the trustworthiness of the New Testament, page 89. I got my copy of that book from a used bookstore. New, uh, they sold new books. So we were in Cambridge, and I knew that the older books would be downstairs. And I was with two or three others that were interested. So as they were chattering and we went down a little narrow street, I beat them to the door and ran downstairs and found it before they got there. So that was interesting to me. Luke was uh, what we would call today a humanitarian. He, in, in his work, he had, and I don't know whether you've ever noticed it, but he had a unique concern for women, for children, for the outcasts of society, those who were poor and in humble condition, those who were despised by the people of their day for harlots, publicans, or tax collectors, and sinners. He had a place in his heart for somebody who needed help. And he shows a special interest in Gentiles and Samaritans. Chapter 10, 
verses 25 through 27. He also reflects on the tolerance of Christ, chapter 9, verses 49 through 56. Chapter 9, 49 through 56. I think one of the amazing things that is very hard to do is to be tolerant with people in their sin without compromising the truth while showing them mercy. I just try that sometimes. Luke's record has been styled in the gospel of sympathy. A fellow by the name of uh, Martian, or at least I think he's the one that wrote it. He it comes from what's called the anti-Martianite prologue, prologue, and one of the earlier ones, 120 to 180 AD in that area. And that's pretty close. Here's what he said about Luke. Luke is a man from Antioch, Syria, a physician by profession. He was a disciple of the apostles, and later he accompanied Paul until his martyrdom. Having neither wife nor child, he served the Lord without distraction. He fell asleep in Boeotia at the age of 84, meaning he died, full of the Holy Spirit. It was imperative that an account of the divine plan be set forth for the Gentile believers. This was necessary in order that they might neither be distracted by Jewish myths nor deceived by heretical and vain fantasies. And let me make a comment on those last two things. If you read through, I'm thinking of the book of Colossians right now, where he talks about science falsely so called. And uh, Paul warned them not to be caught up in Jewish genealogies and all the stuff they put stock in. And that lets us know further how that Matthew wrote for the Jews, Mark wrote basically for the Romans, and Luke wrote for the Gentiles. And he was trying to take them where he found them and keep them from being influenced by all of the, we'll just call it junk, that was out there among the Jews themselves and then among the Gentiles. Paul made the statement that the mystery of iniquity now worketh when he's talking about the falling word of the church. So Paul saw things happening even while the New Testament was being written and he was the writer saying it that was going to bring about the great apostasy from the truth. And the more you study what happened in the latter part of the first century through secular writings or those who claim to be members of the church, the more you realize that what led the church into apostasy were these Jewish fables and a mixture of them and Gentile philosophy. Um, and that all got mixed up. And if you will read the warnings that are given in the New Testament, of uh, people departing from the faith, giving heed to doctrines of devils, speaking lies and hypocrisy, such things as that, then you'll know from whence came those false doctrines. And if you want to see them come together in what is called uh, a Christian church, and many people never knew anything about Christianity, but the Roman Catholic Church, then just look at the crazy doctrines in Roman Catholicism, and you'll see that much of their beginnings came in among Jewish fables and endless genealogies and superstitions and um, the Gentile superstition. One of the things that's very interesting when you go into a place, this is true all over Europe, but when you go into a place like the United Kingdom in England or whether it's 
Ireland or Scotland, and you come to an old, 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 old church, and I don't mean a church 200 years old, I'm talking about something that's been there for a thousand years or more. Many times when you rehearse it, you'll find out that what appeared originally on that site was set up by Roman Catholic missionaries and set up on a pagan religious site. And what they would do would simply take, uh, well, let's just talk about Christmas. And they would take that which was pagan in origin and just simply assign it things that pertain to Christianity. And that's all I'll say about that now. But that's how they did things. Once the church fell away and then hundreds of years passed and out of the apostasy formed the Roman Catholic Church. Don't be found guilty of saying that the Roman Catholic Church is an apostate church. That implies that it was the church at one time and it fell away. Roman Catholicism was never the church. Roman Catholicism formed out of the apostasy of the church. All it is is one of the oldest denominations. Luke, uh, in his work, may well have been preparing an apology, and I don't mean saying I'm sorry, I mean a defense, for the Christians to be used in Paul's forthcoming trial. Now you can see when Paul appeared, and it was Luke that recorded it, remember, before the Jewish council, before Felix, before Festus, and before Agrippa, how he made his defense. And as he defended himself personally, since the reason he was being attacked was because of his Christianity, then the two were together. Thus, when they prepared his case, which he presented before Caesar, and that would have been Nero, then there would have been somebody working with him. And he told Timothy that send the lawyers to him because they were profitable to him. Uh, he stresses the harmless nature of Christ, his message, the message of Christ, and the kingdom of Christ. In chapter 6, verse 35, he said, love your enemies and do them good. That was not the general attitude of anybody at that time. And you can see today how far people have gotten away from that attitude because today uh, it's doing to them before they can do it unto you or retaliate with much vengeance. Then too, we mentioned last week how he said, uh, and this is recorded by Mark, render unto Caesar the things that are Caesar's, chapter 20, verse 25. Now remember, that would sound good standing before Caesar, but that's what the Lord said. Paul said, I find, or rather Pilate, I'm sorry. Pilate said of Jesus Christ, I find no fault in this man. Chapter 23, verse 4. Now that would have been recorded in the official documents of the governors, the procurators of Judea. And what kind of research they would have to do to dig it all out, I don't know. But it would have been there. When you study the Roman historians, Suetonius and others who lived sometime after this, they were able to give us what they gave us because they were being patronized by Caesar. In other words, they were being paid and they had access to the Roman documents in the library official documents. And that's one reason that we can trust much of what they say. Uh, so we could also point out that Herod gave no word of condemnation against Christ in chapter 23, verses 8 through 11. You see, it sounds almost like a lawyer's defense in court of a man. And the Roman centurion who was in charge of the crucifixion said, certainly this is a righteous man. Chapter 23, 47. 
Now, when that's presented in court, and, and when you study Roman law, that is how they did things, they placed a great deal of, of emphasis upon the facts in the case and how you defended yourself. The book of Acts continues after Luke, of course, the book of Acts continues this same approach. And you got to remember he's addressing, which we'll mention, uh, one man, Theophilus. And uh, Acts is a continuation of the book of Luke. So his writings were um, intended for Greek readers. Mark would have been too, but he was primarily thinking of Romans. But this would have covered Gentiles besides Romans. You'll notice that he doesn't quote the Old Testament very much. And he doesn't emphasize the fulfillment of Jewish prophecy. If you will make note, have your notepad as you read through, you'll see that he takes Hebrew terms and gives them Greek equivalents. Now, the Greeks were great, great teachers. They believed in education. The seat of philosophy was in Athens. And while they had a lot of false views, they still had worked well at training people to think. And we have today Aristotelian logic. And what is that? Major premise, minor premise, and conclusion. Now, none of that is written in, that's called a syllogism, none of the reasoning in the Bible, Luke included, uses syllogistic, or let's say this, it's not written in syllogistic form. But you can take every truth because of the nature of truth and set it up in syllogistic form. That's just the nature of truth. The Grecian ideal then was to educate, to elevate, to um, make that complete man. They glorified what was wise and uh, beautiful. Now again, they had all sorts of problems, don't get me wrong. But nevertheless, they taught people how to think. And the gospel appear, uh, appealed to them. After the fall of Jerusalem and Judea and the destruction of the temple and the scattering of the Jews and the uh, killing of thousands of them and selling many others into slavery, this is when the Romans realized they didn't shut down Christianity. Up to that point, most of them thought this was a sect of Judaism. But it's after that, and Jesus virtually predicted it in uh, Matthew 24, when uh, it began to spread. And they realized it's certainly not Jewish. It was after that it began to spread throughout the empire. In other words, from the last 30 years of the first century, it's where it became very obvious to the Roman government that this was spreading through Gentiles and not just through Jews. So Luke holds out Jesus Christ as the perfect man who met the highest ideal of Grecian thought. He simply took them where they were and said, you don't know what you're talking about. Let me show you where you ought to be headed because this is what you've been trying to find. He actually took the same position Paul did when uh, he said, I beheld your devotions and I saw an altar with the inscription to the unknown God whom therefore ye ignorantly worship, I now declare unto you. And that's basically the position that he took. And it would be the position, God's given us that as an inspired example, if you were to go into any country that was pagan and say, I can tell you're very religious people, but you've missed it. Let me declare what you're looking for. I remember the late George Benson, who was president of Harding up till 1965, he spent all of the 1920s in China. And uh, one reason he became such a communist fighter is that he was run out of China by the communists in the early, early, early days of Mao Zedong. And uh, 
Thus, he spent the rest of his life pretty much fighting communism. But be that as it may, Brother Benson said when they first went in, they made the mistake of going just where people gathered. Didn't think about why they gathered, but just where people gathered. And they could hardly get anybody to pay any attention to them or take an interest in what they were doing. And he said, it finally dawned on us that we need to go to the place where religious people are gathering. So then they started having converts. And that makes a difference to realize that you start with proper ground to sow the seed in if you can. A fellow by the name of J.S. Uh, Baxter said, Quote, in Matthew, he is Israel's king. In Mark, he is Jehovah's servant. In Luke, he is the perfect man. And that brings us down, and my watch is right, to about 15 or so after 8. I think we will continue this if all goes well next week. And uh, we'll see what else we can come up with. So we'll, we'll quit here and begin, continue on with what we're doing tonight, next week. Any questions or comments?